Okay, so uh, we are ready to start again with our session on next generation communications. The next presentation in this uh, session will be given by uh, Professor Palmieri from the Department of Information Engineering at the University of Padova and will be entitled Next Generation Optical Communications. So uh, Luca Palmieri received a PhD in electronic and telecommunication engineering in 2000 from the University of Padova, where he has been uh, assistant professor from 2004 to 2015, and is now associate professor since 2015. His research activity is mainly focused on linear and nonlinear propagation effects in single and few mode optical fibers with application on telecommunications, fiber characterization, nonlinear optical signal processing, and optical fiber sensors. He is TPC member of ECOC, OFC, and OFS, and he has co authored more than 200 scientific publications and is associate editor of the journal Optics and Laser Technology, Elsevier, and former topical editor of, of optics letters. So uh, I think this is a very good opportunity to hear about the next generation optical communication systems also on the activity carried out in our department. So please, Luca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matteo. You've been very kind and good morning <clears throat> to everyone. So let me share the presentation. Can you please confirm you are seeing the presentation? It's loading, yes, now we see it. Okay, great. <clears throat> so in this hour or so, I will provide you an overview of which is the hot topic um, in optical telecommunications, at least on, let's say, the physical layer because uh, telecommunication systems are rather complex. They um, include so many different technologies and level of um, human intervention, let's say. So <clears throat> I'm going to focus uh, on the channel, the communication channel, which is basically the, the optical fiber. And I know the audience is quite um, varying, varied. So I try to be not too specific, at the same time, not too trivial, I hope. I met the right uh, sweet spot. Okay, so let me start by trying to change. Yeah, here it is. Let me start with a short historical overview of what, is, what optical telecommunications are. And what I'm going to show you is a movie I borrowed from New York Times. They made a reportage on this topic, um, I think a couple of years ago, something like that, or maybe even earlier. And as we'll see in a while, then the movie starts, you will see here years passing by. So let me go. I hope there's not too lag through Zoom, but what you're seeing here is how the submarine cable optical fiber network has been growing over years. So just in case some of you didn't know, but um, most of our um, large majority, I, I would say it not, almost all of our telecommunication goes through under uh, submarine cable when they have to cross seas, let's say. They, very few amount of information is nowadays transmitted to satellites. And what you see here is this submarine cable network uh, as it is today. You might notice these uh, connection highlighted in yellow. Uh, they are owned by service providers like Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, uh, whereas historically the cable were installed by let's say big telecom providers, uh, so telecom operators. Now uh, the, the need for communication bandwidth is so strong that even the service provider are installing their own piece of networks. So what I wanted to um, to highlight here, but why maybe um, submarine cable deploying. It's something fascinating. You can find a lot of information in the internet. I would suggest you to go there and have a look. Um, there are interesting stories about the ships, about technologies and history dating back to old telegraph cables. Um, I just wanted to show you this picture taken from an installation, a recent installation of 
a cable, trans transatlantic cable from owned by Microsoft and Facebook. In particular, look at this. This is the bobbing of about 6,000 kilometers of fiber. I think it's a pretty satisfying picture. Anyhow, <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to show you this uh, map is this. You see here, we are in 1994. Um, probably some of you, if not most, but not even born. And the first short submarine uh, fiber link starts uh, being deployed. And we have to wait until minutes two and, what is that? Here it is, 1996, to, to see the first transoceanic um, optical fiber links. After this date, the installation of transoceanic uh, cable basically flourished. And the question is, what, what's behind that? What happened in 1996 or around there? So <clears throat> there were two, I would say, two main, as they call it, CAT, key and enabling technology. So as I said, there are a lot of technology in the telecommunication system. So it's not just a matter of a bunch of ideas, but um, you need all the single pieces to make up the whole system. But at some point, um, there was specifically one device that was able to open up uh, optical telecommunication as we know them today. And the device I'm mentioning is the Airbnb fiber amplifier. So of course, you had also to have the fibers, but the fiber were around already since a few years. And they were one of the key in enabling technologies, basically because fibers are an excellent transmission channel. They are excellent from any point of view. Probably the um, most evident one is the attenuation that the optical fiber has um, with respect to light or the attenuation that light experiences when uh, being transmitted across the optical fiber. I see from this picture, the value is in general, below 0 0.35 dB per kilometer. And these values, the attenuation is below this value over an extremely large wavelength range. It's about 400 nanometer, which amounts to about more than 50 terahertz of useful bandwidth. The minimum is in the so-called C band, is around the C band, it's around 50 nanometer. And it's below 0 0.2 dB per kilometer. In case you're not familiar with dBs, this means that after 15 kilometer uh, of optical fiber, the optical signal has still more than half the initial power. So you need 15 kilometer of optical power to alven, sorry, of fiber optics to alven the optical power, which no other transmission channel is able to do. But as I said, it's not just a matter of the optical fiber, it's also a matter of this small device, the Herbium Double Fiber Amplifier. It's an optical amplifier. It's a, basically a, a laser without the resonant cavity. It's a laser without the mirrors. It just amplifies light that goes through. And these enable the implementation of a very, very successful um, technologies, technology, which is the WDM, Wavelength Division Multiplexing. Now, the idea behind Wavelength division multiplexing might sound a little bit trivial. After all, what we are doing here, we are using different optical frequency to transmit different channels, which is the same thing that I've been doing right in radio communication for so many years. You know, radio transmit each on its own channel. The same is for um, TV broadcasting in general. The idea of dividing the available spectrum in channels centered at different frequency, it's absolutely known since, well, I think, a century now, nowadays. Um, but the advent of the EDFA enabled that technology to be implemented also in uh, optical fiber communication. And why do I say that? Because see here, WDM channel nowadays are standardized with a spacing of 100 gigahertz. And there is also a version of the WDM, which is called dense WDM, where channels are spaced um, by 50 gigahertz. And this channel spacing is somehow related to the limits of the uh, optoelectronic front end, because at the end, this optical signal has to be received by a photodiode and possibly amplified and, uh, and treated with some electronics. And <clears throat> so these numbers are somehow 
um, constrained by the available bandwidth at the electronic level, but the optical amplifier, as this picture was suggesting, is offering a bandwidth of like fan, ranging from five to 10 terahertz. So a single optical amplifier can amplify hundreds of these WDM channels. And that is why um, WDM was so successful because now you had just to deploy under the sea floor a, a cable with an amplifier repeating every like 50 or maybe 100 kilometers or so. And you do not have to worry about demultiplexing a single channel, converting the light back in the, into an electrical signal to regenerate the signal. You just send light through the link. And this was so successful that you see over here the capacity of the transmission system over a single uh, fiber skyrocketed rocketed, and improved by almost three orders of magnitude because that is the kind of amount of WN channels you put you can you can put on a on, on a fiber. Now this is the moment where, in some sense, from a technological point of view the internet as we know it uh, was born because uh, it was this huge amount of, uh, the availability of huge amount of bandwidth that pushed people to, to develop the idea of the internet and devise new, sorry, um, think about new services in the internet and that spurred all these uh, as we know it today. Of course, uh, it's not just a matter of a single link. Uh, telecommunication are about networks, so you would like to be able to uh, connect different sources with different uh, destination across a network. And this is nowadays what um, an optically routed networks look like. It exploits these devices, which are called RODAM, reconfigurable optical address multiplexers. They are integrated devices that are able to add or drop a specific wavelength out of uh, out of a WDM aggregate. And so, for example, they allow to do what is uh, sketched in this figure. Uh, you have the green transmitter, with, which goes through several of these road uh, until it reaches the uh, final destination. And you see along the network, it can be transmitted on the same link with other uh, channel operating at different frequencies. Now, this reconfigurability in the network can be used to uh, reconfigure the network as a response to an increase of the local traffic, or maybe as in response to some damage to, to a branch of the, of the network. Of course, it's not just a matter of adding channels. It's also a matter of how smart, how good uh, we are in uh, zipping information inside the single channel. And this goes back to this theoretical limit that was calculated by Shannon. It's a uh, theoretical limit that applies to every transmission channel. And it says what is the maximum capacity of the channel given its bandwidth and given the SNR of the signal being transmitted across, uh, across the, the channel itself. So to increase the capacity, you have to either increase the bandwidth, but as we said at some point, uh, the single channel has a limit, has a technological limit, or you may think about increasing the SNR. To be true, uh, to be true, this limit is pretty high, so it's not easy to reach this limit. In order to reach this limit, you have to actually increase what is called the spectral efficiency, uh, which is, at the end is this number, uh, which is the number of bit per second you are able to transmit for each hertz of spectrum. And this is about basically modulation format. You see this picture uh, is reporting again, it's up to 2010. So this, the, the curve has been growing, but this is showing us the spectral efficiency of a single channel has been growing over here. So this growth contributed together with the WDM approach to increase the capacity of the optical uh, fiber links. As I was saying, modulation format, let me review very quickly what, what, I'm, what is this about. Uh, the simplest modulation format that you can have, and it's used quite commonly still nowadays in optical fiber communication is so called the on-off king. It's a digital modulation format, which simply, if you want to transmit bit one, you transmit some amount of optical power, 
uh, which could be pulsed or not. If you uh, want to transmit bit zero, you don't transmit optical power. Now, for example, the spectrum of uh, this kind of modulation looks like these. This quantity R is the repetition rate. So for example, for a 40 gigabit per second on off keying channel, the bandwidth occupied by the channel is about 80 gigahertz. And so you see that this kind of modulation is compatible with standard WDM, where channels are separated 100 gigahertz apart. So you can put different of these channels next by each other, but it's not at all fitted for dense WDM, where channels are expected to be uh, closer um, in, uh, in frequency down to 50 uh, megahertz. How can you shrink the bandwidth while not decreasing the amount of information, so the bit rate of the channel? So what do you have to do? You have to use more complex uh, modulation formats, in general, multi-level modulation formats. So this one are about just modulating, let's say, on the real axis. So I forgot to mention this graph here, For if you're not familiar with these are the, this is the complex plane. And it's representing the fact that when you modulate light, but in general, when you modulate a, a carrier, even if you're doing a radio frequency transmission, so you can modulate both the amplitude and the phase. So these two quantities are mapped in the complex plane. And this is representing the showing that if you just modulate on one of the axes of the complex plane, you can achieve some uh, capacity and there are capacity limits that cannot go cannot be uh, gone beyond because it's the limit of the modulation format. But if you go to full complex modulation formats, these are actually called quadrature and in-phase modulation formats, you can increase the capacity of the single limit and, uh, and approach the channel limit. So these QIM modulation formats are pretty, pretty common and are extremely common in radio communication. And they are becoming more and more common in optical fiber communication also. So the reason why this technology um, takes some time to, to reach optical communication is because one thing is making like 1024 QIM at few gigahertz for radio communication. And the other, something completely different is making um, 1024 QIM at several tens of gigahertz for optical communication. So you need quite a more sophisticated electronics. And as a future perspective of modulation format, let me mention these uh, constellation shaping, uh, which is about trying to, to mimic a Gaussian distribution on the, uh, on the way in which you use the, you distribute information across the complex plane, uh, because that can be shown, can bring the performance and the efficiency closer to the channel limit. And so either you do that by using constellation that are no longer as regular as in QIM, or by doing this is called probabilistic constellation shaping. So by adding, sorry, associating to each element of the constellation uh, symbols with different probabilities. And so this is something that is being doing now, nowadays. Um, <clears throat> all these kind of effort, as, as I said, was um, as spurred the, um, the implementation of more and more uh, optical fiber link. At the same time, the availability of such a bandwidth has spurred the development of new services and the two, uh, I mean, the, that sort of feedback was installed between the two. So nowadays, look at these figures. There are more than 1 billion of kilometers of optical fiber, way more than 1 billion of kilometer of optical fibers installed in, in around the world. And maybe I can use a laser pointer also. Yeah, here we are. And by the way, the submarine cable is actually a small portion of the whole amount of optical fiber installed uh, worldwide. And this is another astonishing figure here. Uh, you see, this is the total capacity that can be handled by the optical ports installed in, by, in the optical transponder around the world. So these amount to more than one hectabit per second. So this is like more than one billion of gigabit per second. This is the amount of information that can be handled uh, globally by the optical networks nowadays. So, <clears throat> 
I'd seen a pretty successful story. Uh, this is a graph you're going to see a bunch of times. Uh, again, about the history of the capacity of transmission across the optical fiber. You started with improving the optical fiber itself. Then the EDFA came in, which allowed, uh, enabled the WDM technology, high spectral uh, efficiency coding. And now we are here, um, well, somewhere here, where it seems that we are reaching a kind of limit. So it seems that the trend is departing from these uh, trend we had at the earliest year. So what is going on here? So first of all, and notice what, where this limit is. We are talking about 100 terabits per second over a single fiber. Um, that might sound quite a large limit. So probably we might think, should we worry about that? Well, actually, yes, we should worry about that because we have to consider which is the capacity demand. And there are several of these forecasts. These are, for example, made by Cisco, which is one of the main player in uh, network devices. And for example, he forecasted that in five years from 2017 to 2022, the average traffic per capita worldwide per month is more than, is, is increased more than three times or about three times. And the number of devices connected to the internet is also steadily increasing over here. And, and in particular, notice this green region here, which is referring to what they call the machine to machine communication, which is the internet of things. So machine communicating between them without human intervention. And <clears throat> another figure is this one. Uh, this is about the traffic the kind of traffic there is on, on the submarine network. At the beginning, most of the traffic was uh, related to the internet backbone, so it was related to our communication. But you see that in the last year, more than 50% of the uh, traffic is generated by content providers like uh, YouTube, Netflix, these video on demand services, cloud services. So, <clears throat> and this doesn't mean that the internet backbone shrank. This is just a percentage. So the absolute values are increasing as well. And this is not considering what may happen in some specific application, you know, sorry, conditions like what happened during the uh, COVID pandemic we are experiencing. Uh, maybe you heard news about uh, Netflix and YouTube cutting the streaming quality of their services in Europe because they were concerned about uh, the uh, in increase in demand of those services that might have been uh, critical for the network. So indeed, there is a very strong pressure on, um, on our uh, optical fiber network, and we need to increase the capacity of these, of these networks. And people start to worry, started to worry about that technological limit we have seen before and start wondering what was causing that capacity crunch. And the answer is basically here in this slide. So if you look at the channel limit, it says that you can increase the capacity in principle with no limit. You either have to increase the, the, the bandwidth of the channel or you have to increase the SNR. Now, <clears throat> in principle, you can increase the bandwidth of the single channel um, okay, it might be difficult to increase the bandwidth of the single channel because of the current uh, optoelectronic technologies, but you, there is a lot of bandwidth in the optical fiber which is still not exploited. Remember, the EDF phase is just amplifying like 10% of the available bandwidth. And in any case, you might think about increasing the SNR by increasing the optical, uh, the intensity, the power of the uh, signal you are transmitting. But the problem here is that Shannon analysis was based on the fact that the channel was linear. So it has some filtering characteristic. It was affected by additive noise, but what didn't consider, what was not considered by the Shannon analysis is that actually the optical fiber, it's an linear channel or it can be an linear channel. What is that about? So <clears throat> this is the structure of an optical fiber. You probably know it's made of silica. Um, the most common optical fiber, the one we use for uh, high capacity transmission links are made of silica. And light is actually confined in the central region of the fiber, which is, show, which is called the core. And the core is again silica, but it's slightly doped silica in such a way that the refractive index of the code core 
is slightly higher than the refractive index of the surrounding silica, which is called the cladding. And so the light gets trapped inside the core. Now, everything here is about, to simplify very much the picture, is about the refractive indices of the material. And you probably remember, or you know, depending on what is your uh, expertise, that refractive index is a number which is characteristic of material. So for example, pure silica at 1550 nanometer has a refractive index of 1.444 and several other digits. However, this is just a simplified picture because the truth is that the refractive index of a material can vary as a function of the intensity of the signal propagating in a material itself. So the situation is that if the intensity of the signal is high enough, this, the signal itself is going to change slightly the refractive index of the material. What are the consequences of these, uh, of these nonlinear refractive index we have here? Uh, there is this picture um, that has been proposed several years ago. I think it catches in a very qualitative way what is going on with nonlinear optics. Now consider a runner running on an hard surface or on a hard map. Now its running experience is going to be basically the same no matter um, which the, who the runner is. But if the surface over which the runner is running is soft, then the runner itself by its own weight is going to create a dip on the, on the surface. And of course, the presence of that deep will somehow influence its running experience, let's call it like that. And clearly, the heavier the runner, the deeper the deep, and the more different is going to be the running experience with respect to what might happen uh, on an art surface. So this is the key point. In, on an art surface, no matter the weight of the runner, the running experience is going to be the same. On a soft, sur soft surface, the running experience is going to be dependent on on the runner weight. And this is actually the essence, oversimplified essence of optical nonlinearity. And there is also another consideration to do, suppose that there are more runners running on the same surface. If the surface is, is hard, they will not interfere each other, except maybe for some traffic to be dealt with. But if they are running on a soft surface, even the other runners are going to experience the same deep created by the heavier uh, runner. And this is to say that uh, this is a very qualitative explanation of what is going on in an optical fiber. If you have a very strong signal, this strong signal can change as we have seen the refractive index of the fiber. And as a consequence, that change in the refractive index is, uh, is affecting not only the signal itself, which is a phenomenon that would, is called in optic cell phase modulation, but also the other runner, so the other signals, the other channel, which is called cross-phase modulation. Now, <clears throat> this is a PhD school, so we can go just with uh, comics and sketches. We have to do a little bit of math. So let me show you this equation. This is a very simple uh, linear partial differential equation, which describes the propagation of light in linear regime. So for the moment, we are neglecting that there might be these nonlinear effects. And this equation is just telling us how the light amplitude, complex amplitude, so there is also phase here, varies along the fiber uh, as a function of the attenuation of the fiber, of this phase delay induced by propagation, the propagation delay due to the uh, group velocity of, of the signal propagating across the fiber, and this last term is uh, a dispersion, which is known as chromatic dispersion. Um, <clears throat> whenever you have no linearities, you have to add another term. This nonlinear term, and you see it's nonlinear because it, it's not just proportional to the uh, field amplitude, but it's proportional to the field amplitude through the field intensity itself. And the, the phenomenon is controlled by these nonlinear uh, coefficient gamma. One of the things important about nonlinear coefficient gamma is that it depends on the nonlinear relative index I mentioned before, but it also depends on the, this number, which is the effective area, which you can safely think is the area of the core. So if you change the area of the core, you change these 
nonlinear coefficient and you change the nonlinear effect that the signal experiences while propagating the fiber. In particular, notice here, the larger the core, the lower the nonlinear coefficient. So why I'm telling you these, putting these math, because I want to highlight three main uh, properties about nonlinearity in optical fiber. First of all, they depend on power density. So they do not depend on the total power flowing inside the optical fiber, but they depend on the power density. I mean, watt per, per, per square meter, okay? So it's a power per unit of surface and the surface is the cross section of the optical fiber. Nonlinear effects accumulate, accumulates along the fiber. And this is clear here, you see, and the variation along the fiber depends on the nonlinear effect. And this is also a reason why in, in uh, optical fiber communication, no linear effects can be important, cannot be neglected because in optical fiber, you cover the signal covers extremely long distances. We just saw transoceanic distances. There are several tens of thousand, sorry, several thousands of kilometers. And so even if the nonlinear uh, effect is small, it has a long distance to accumulate up to a non-negligible level. And the last very important properties is that nonlinear phenomena are instantaneous. Look at these again. So I didn't report it here, but this quantity depends on space and time. And this says that what happened at specific time, or sorry, the nonlinear term, uh, depends on the amplitude at a specific time. So it's instantaneous. So this means that the nonlinear effect depend on the kind of signal you're transmitting, depend on the information you're transmitting. So if you are doing an on-off keying, um, sorry, a multi-level uh, modulation format, if you're transmitting a strong signal, you will have a stronger nonlinear effect. If you're transmitting a weaker signal, uh, you will have a weaker, the signal will experience a weaker uh, nonlinear effect. And this effect on, is on a bit phase, okay? So <clears throat> what is the consequence of this nonlinear effect? If you simplify drastically the math, the, the consequence is pretty simple. The signal just um, is affected by this phase term, which depends on the intensity of the signal itself. And it grows uh, with distance. So this is why it's called cell phase modulation, because the signal is inducing a phase variation on itself. And this kind of phase variation is instantaneous. It depends on the specific data you're transmitting on, on, on the channel. It depends on the channel through the gamma coefficient. Um, and it causes, in general, a broadening, a spectral broadening of uh, the signal you are transmitting, which is bad, because you are doing WDM transmission, and you don't want your uh, signal to, uh, to, in, uh, to, to interfere with the nearby channel. However, Weird as it is, nonlinearity, this cell phase modulation is a deterministic effect. I mean, it depends on the nonlinear coefficient of the fiber that can be measured once and for all. It depends on the data being transmitted, but the transmitter knows which data is going to transmit. So in principle, since the transmitters know the data, it can be informed about the route it will, the signal will follow. At least in principle, the transmitter can apply a pre-distortion to the optical signal so to compensate the nonlinear phenomenon that will happen during transmission, okay? So in some sense, cell phase modulation is not really a big issue. However, we said that very winning technology is WDM. And in WDM, you have many channels being transmitted at the same time across the optical fiber. And remember what we said about nonlinearity. Remember the many runners running on the same surface, they interfere each other because they all sense the deep caused by the other channel. So the same thing is in the WDN. Channels feel or sense the refractive index variation due to the other channel. So the, the equation varies in this way. Now we are considering the equation for the thin field amplitude of a single channel, the pi one. And what we have to change here is this nonlinear term is no longer being dependent on the signal itself, but it actually depends on the uh, field being transmitted on the other channels, okay? So 
And notice that there is here a factor two because actually this, which is called cross phase modulation because it depends on the nearby channel, is twice as strong as cell phase modulation, but it, it has um, physical origin that has not, I mean, would be too difficult to explain here, too long to explain here. So what it's really important here is to consider that now, think about the green transmitter. The green transmitter, uh, okay, maybe he knows the data, sure, for sure he knows the data is going to transmit. It may be informed about the path it go, is going to, his signal is going to follow. But of course, there is no way in which the green transmitter can be informed about the other data being transmitted in nearby channel. Okay, there is no way in which you can even don't cannot think about having the orange transmitter sending his data to the green transmitter and then sending everything to the green and orange receiver is basically nonsense. So the point is that this quantity here, from the point of view of the channel we are considering, are random. Okay, there is no way that the transmitter can foresee what is going to be. And so in this perspective, no linear, this nonlinear cross phase modulation acts as a noise, as a random noise acting on the signal. And the bad news is that it is a multiplicative noise. And that is the bad news because probably I forgot to mention, but the Shannon capacity limit formula we saw before has been calculated assuming that the noise is additive. So we are completely disrupting the picture, or rather we, cross-phase modulation is completely disrupting the picture. The canon limit, as we know, it doesn't hold any longer. And so the question is, what, happen, what happens when you consider these new source of multiplicative noise? Well, the answer was given about 20 years ago by this seminal paper by Mitra and Stark. There are two researchers from, uh, from the Bell Labs. Uh, the paper was published in Nature, so just to give you the importance of their result, they were able to calculate the, um, in some sense, the capacity in the presence of this cross-phase um, modulation-induced multiplicative noise, and the result is here. It's pretty shocking. You see that as you increase the uh, power density, at the beginning, the spectral efficiency increases following the linear channel limit. But then, because of nonlinearity, it reaches a maximum, and beyond that maximum, is drop, it drops back to zero, and actually drops quickly, more quickly than, than it was growing at the beginning. So this is clearly showing why there is this limit in the, uh, in the capacity of a single fiber. So what can we do? Can we go beyond this limit? Can we find a way to go beyond the limit? But there were some ideas. Though. So the first one is wrong. Trying to increase the exploited ban optical bandwidth in the optical fiber. Of course, that doesn't solve the problem because you are just adding more channels, more WGN channels to the fiber. So you're increasing uh, the total amount of power. Said Nonlinearities are controlled by the power density, but the uh, cross section of the fiber is constant. So you're increasing also the, the power density. And so this is absolutely not a good idea. You might think about using brand new optical fibers. So what you see here, let me spend a little bit of time commenting what this picture is. So first of all, this is a picture. This is a, a picture taken with um, uh, a SAM a scanning electron micro microscope, so it's not a drawing. Um, the gray area you see here is the cladding, so you have to think that that gray area extends up to uh, a wall uh, cylindrical section. It's the cladding surrounding the fiber. The black area is void, or rather is air, okay? So this is air, and this gray circle are the section of very thin glass capillaries. So uh, first of all, it's pretty fascinating. They are able to, to draw this kind of optical fibers. Notice the scale here, it's 300 microns. So the thickness of these capillaries is below one micron. It should be in the order of a few hundreds of nanometer, maybe even below 100 nanometer. I'm not sure about that. And the result is that this structure is able to confine light in the center. So the ability of this waveguide is to guide light in air. Of course, light is going to interact a little bit 
with these glass capillaries, but you might imagine that the superposition between light and glass is so small that basically those nonlinear phenomenon we are so worried about do not take place. So <clears throat> these kind of fiber that are able to guide light in air uh, basically um, drastically reduce up to down to a negligible level nonlinear effects. And also you have um, um, a bonus, uh, 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 I would say bonus track, but this is not a, an LP, but anyhow, you have a, a bonus feature, which is that light in, in air propagates at 50% uh, faster uh, velocity. And that is reducing the lag of transmission across this optical fiber by almost, by more than by 30%, basically. And this is something that might be interesting. For example, uh, if you have heard about high-speed trading, that would be quite interesting, but that is, that's another story. So let's go on you know, in, in trying to understand how we can in, in overcome this crime. So this fiber could be used, but they are very recent technology. They are yet not mature. And in any case, it's also not clear how you could do amplification, optical amplification in this fiber, because at the time being, it is not possible to do optical amplification out of thin air. So this is not a way that can be pursued soon to, to go beyond the uh, capacity limit of current fibers. Well, there is an option. It's pretty trivial. You just install more optical fiber. After all, a single optical fiber is a glass strand with a diameter of 125 micron, is one over eight of millimeter. So it's pretty small. Once you install one, you can install two of them. And indeed, this is what is being done nowadays. They are installing more and more optical fiber. However, the very successful story of WDM suggests that if you are able to, very successful commercial, sorry, the very um, successful, sorry, the, oh, come on. The very good commercial success of WDM suggests that if you are able to increase the capacity of a single fiber, that would be a much more cost-effective approach to the problem of increasing uh, the overall capacity. So what we are left with, so probably some new multiplexing scheme. And the answer yeah, is yes, that, that's the point. So by now, what we are doing, of course, we are multiplexing the information in time. We saw that you can do uh, high uh, spectral efficiency by implementing quadrature. We spend a lot talking about frequency modulation. I didn't mention polarization modulation, uh, sorry, multiplexing. Um, I didn't mention the light as these very unique light and electromagnetic fields in general have the, these very unique properties, which is property, which is polarization. And in general, there are two orthogonal polarization and being orthogonal, these two polarization can be used as two independent transmission channel. And this is actually what is being doing in uh, high capacity links. There is this dual polarization where the two orthogonal polarization are treated as independent channel. But this approach doesn't neither solve the problem because still you are adding more power to the same fiber. And as there is cross phase modulation, there is also cross polarization modulation and is slightly different in terms of numbers from cross phase modulation, but the final result is the same. It's again causing a multiplicative noise. So what we are left with, we are left with space. So we are left with the cross section of the optical fiber. So the idea is to try to use in a more efficient way, the cross section of the optical fiber. What does it mean? So by the way, um, by the way, whenever you have questions, just stop me, but I'm afraid I cannot see a raised hand. So if you want to make a question, just open the microphone and speak aloud, please. Yes, but don't worry, there is a uh, Michele, uh, the PhD student who is, uh, I mean, uh, oh, okay, okay, chat okay. periodically and we'll let you know if there is a question on the chat as well. Okay, thank you, Michele. And thank you, Matteo. So, <clears throat> The idea behind using the space is what is called space division multiplexing. And this is the last time I show you this graph. And it's actually what is the, the technology that is nowadays allowing us to go beyond the uh, capacity limit of uh, 
let's say, standard approach to fiber optic communication. What, what is about, uh, what is SDM about, spatial division multiplexing about? So you have to know that when you consider an optical fiber and you ask yourself how the light power distributes across the fiber cross section, then um, you have to know that light organizes itself in structures, in patterns that are called, uh, that are called modes. So, in, so far, we have been talking about single mode fibers. Single mode fibers are characterized by, let me be a little bit loose at this point, are characterized by a core which is so small that light can distribute its power in just a single way, in just a single mode. And this single mode is just a simple spot. So if you look at the light being transmitted by these single mode fibers, you would just see a spot. No matter how you launch the light on the other side of the fiber, the spot is going to be always the same. However, if you increase the size of the core, then you enter in this so-called multimode regime, uh, or you build a multimode fiber, where having more space, the fiber can organize itself in different modes, and these are some of them are depicted here. Now, depending on how large is the core, this number of modes can 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 reach hundreds or even more. So, um, this number of modes can be very high depending on how large is the um, is the fiber core. The key point, the main facts you have to know about the modes propagating an optical fiber is, well, the first one we just said, the larger the core, the larger the number of modes. The second one is that modes are orthogonal. So orthogonality is a mathematical property, but at the end, what it means is that these modes are physically distinguishable. And if they are physically distinguishable, you can use them to transmit independent channels. So you can use each of these modes to transmit an independent channel. And actually you can do something more than that because on each of these modes, you can transmit more WDM channels. And we'll say something more than about these later on. However, you have to consider one thing, which is critical, uh, which is that different modes propagate with different group velocities. So you should expect that signal being transmitted, for example, in the fundamental mode will reach the, uh, the fiber output. So we reach the transmitted with a slightly larger delay compared to modes being transmitted on, um, sorry, the reverse, with a, a little shorter delay with respect to modes being transmitted on high order modes. Okay, so there might be this delay between signals being transmitted on, on different modes. But anyhow, does this approach solve the problem? Because at the end, it seems like we are in any case adding channel to the fibers. And actually the answer is yes. SDM solves the problem of nonlinearity. And the reason is just because of what I said a moment before, if you want to increase the number of modes, you have to increase the uh, the core cross section and actually it can be shown that to a very good approximation the number of modes scales with the area of the fiber now this graph is representing that the quadratic number of modes because this is a quadratic scale a uh, quadratic axis scales linearly with the core diameter so the message is that the number of modes scales with the area of, uh, of the core of the fiber. And so if you uh, scale linearly with, with, with that area, and so if you increase linearly the area, you increase linearly proportionally the number of modes, which means that it's assuming that you're launching the same power on each mode, which is reasonable, you are increasing linear, linearly the total amount of power you are sending inside the fiber. But as I said before, no linear effect do not depend on the total amount of power. They do depend on the power densities. And since the total power and the area are growing proportionally, the power density is basically constant. And that is the essence of SDM. That is why you can increase the capacity in the optical fiber by increasing the number of modes without 
uh, without encountering these nonlinear uh, related problems that we just mentioned. And so you can keep on increasing the capacity of a single fiber. Now, <clears throat> Uh, just enlarging the core is not the only options you have. There is another uh, strategy, which is actually nowadays, is, it seems to be the, the winning approach compared to just increasing the core. And the idea is, is building multi-core fibers. So as this picture suggests, inside the fiber, you have more cores. And there are two kinds of flavors you can have in this kind of multi-core fibers. The first one is the uncoupled multicore fiber, in which the core are separated enough so that they behave like independent channels. So it's like if you have squeezed inside this inside the same space, like consider this picture, you have squeezed four different independent fibers. Okay, uh, that some doesn't sound a very great idea. You're just shrinking the size of the fiber, but actually. It, it is a winning approach in some application, as we will see. Uh, and the other approach is when the core are pretty close to each other, like in this picture or even in this one. In that case, the cores are so-called couplet, which means you cannot treat one core as an independent quantity entity because that core is going to be influenced also by the nearby cores. And so you have to consider the modes of the wall structure. And what happens is, for example, su suggested here in this graph, which is representing the first three modes of a three core fiber. You see the, the simplest mode is when the three spots, the three cores are illuminated at the same way. And then there are these two combination where one is illuminated and is not illuminated. The other two are illuminated with the opposite pieces. And, and finally this one. And, and you can see that there might be higher order modes also in these conditions. So <clears throat> apparently this technology, well, this technology is different from the multimode fiber we considered before. Uh, you have to implement different um, production processes, but from the uh, theoretical point of view, you are still dealing with a fiber which has more than one spatial mode. And so in principle, what I'm going to say from now on applies to multimode fibers, as well as to multi-core fibers at the same way with just some small technological difference. Um, let's see some uh, technology related to SDM, because of course, it's not just a matter of having the optical fibers. Uh, for example, first of all, you have to be able to do multiplexing and demultiplexing. So you have to be able to start, you basically start from a single laser. We saw in the presentation before, and everything starts from the laser that is generating your optical signal. And then you have to convince light to enter just the specific core or to be coupled to the specific mode of the fiber. How can you do that? So you need a multiplexer and demultiplexer. One approach is uh, represented here is made with these devices are called photonic lanterns. Basically you start with single mode fibers or in this second integrated device, you start with single mode waveguides and then you adiabatically, adiabatically taper these waveguides into a single couplet entity through which you're going to excite either each mode of fiber or a mixture, more likely a mixture of modes of the fiber or the different cores of the fiber to which you are coupled. Now, clearly these devices are reciprocal, so they also work the other way around. If you enter from this side with an higher order mode, that mode is going to be, let's say, projected on different uh, outputs, single mode outputs. So here you have, you can have the several receiver that uh, measure the spatial components of the signal being transmitted across the fiber. Another technology which is pretty successful nowadays, it's quite promising, is based on face masks. So what you see here is a sketch of this kind of devices. And here you have a picture of the devices. So this um, these surface here is a reflecting surface onto which a well-calibrated face mask has been uh, carved, has been realized somehow. This other surface is a mirror. So the light is entering from this side. And from this side, one of these modes can enter into the device. 
and then the light starts bouncing on and off between these two plates and at any, at any step it gets a small phase um, small phase modulation I mean spatial phase modulation because you see this phase max changes uh, according to the position and going through these uh, adiabatic phase variation, that specific mode is converted in, into one of these output single mode spots. Okay, so you enter with like from the fundamental mode and probably the fundamental mode is going to be mapped on the first spot. And then probably another mode is going to be mapped onto the nth spot at the output. And so you can separate uh, in space the different modes. And again, the device is reciprocal. So if you enter in any of these specific port at the output, you get the specific I heard the mode that has to be then coupled to the, the fiber. Another key parameter, sorry, key device is the amplifier. We said that the EDFA has been the key, one of the key enabling technology that unleashed the capacity, the full capacity of WDM uh, system. And so, of course, if you want to unleash the full capacity of uh, SDM system, you have to build an SDM uh, multimode or multi-core amplifier. This is kind of tricky. There is still a lot of research going on. Uh, the general approach is that you pump the laser. So let me spend a few words about how an optical amplifier works. Uh, they are, as I said before, laser with, lasers without mirrors. So somehow you have to deliver energy to the active material, which typically it's erbium. Well, it's erbium, maybe supported by some other uh, element like yttrium in this case. So you have to deliver energy to the erbium by a pumping process. And then the erbium is able to use that, extra, that energy to amplify, basically to create copy, to create copy of the photon of the signal coming through the, going through the device. So this pumping is done typically by coupling light into the cladding of the fiber, okay? And so, um, so that, and this is done because one of the most critical parameters, as we will see in a while, is the mode dependent gain. So you don't want the amplifier to amplify different modes or different cores uh, with a different gain, with a different, uh, yeah, with a different gain. You don't want that because, because as we will see, mode dependent gain is a limit to the transmission capacity. Um, well, I think it's time to see what, why is that? So the problem is this. Now we understood that with space division multiplexing, you can have more spatial mode and each of them can carry, um, can carry a channel. However, you should not think that these modes are actually this channel are actually independent of each other because this independency between modes, it's actually an approximation that can be disrupted if the fiber structure departs from its ideal configuration. And this typically happens. So whenever you, the fiber is exposed to bending, twisting, maybe there is an external pressure due to the cabling um, the fiber itself is not ideal during the production, it departs from the, its ideal design. So all these conditions causes modes to couple each other. What does it mean? It means that the light being launched onto one mode, which would be one channel, actually uh, passes also to other channels. So there is channel crosstalk. And you might remember this equation is describing the single channel. Apparently the same equation is describing the whole set of um, SDM channel, channels, but the point is that all these scalar quantities you had here are now become, are now matrices. So the problem, the transmission problem across the fiber has become a vector problem. There is multipath interference. There is this crosstalk, which is also called coupling among nodes. Um, you have to understand that this coupling is random along the fiber because it depends on how the fiber has been deployed. It depends on how the fiber is being produced. So it is random along the fiber, but most important, it is also random 
along uh, as a function of time. And that is because temperature radiation are able to shuffle all these, uh, the effects of all these perturbations. So coupling among, the, among modes, this crosstalk among modes is both random in space and in time. And that's an issue. So there are two scenarios. Let me show you a little bit more of math. Um, we saw propagation in time domain. It was a rather weird uh, equation. Well, weird, complex equation. Uh, we can neglect no linear effect by now because we said that with SDN we can get rid of no linear effect. And you know that a linear system can be more efficiently effectively describing frequency domain. So it's much more easier to write an equation describing how the spectrum of the signal of the field being transmitted across the optical fiber varies along the function and as a function of frequency, because now this is just, well, there is still the partial derivative sign, but this is actually an ordinary derivative. This just varies along distance according to uh, to this equation where you have this matrix, which is called the coupling matrix, is a complex n by n matrix, n is the number of modes being transmitted um, across the fiber. E is an uh, n-dimensional complex vector. And this matrix, as I said, is random because of the randomness of coupling. And as a result, this is pretty trivial. The light has n channels at the input, and channels at the output. So its spectral response is described by an N by N transmission uh, matrix, okay? Now, let me make one simplifying assumption. Let us assume that each mode, and remember that for me, mo modes are either modes of a multi-mode fiber or spatial configuration in a multi-core fiber. So the, they are exactly the same from this point of view. So let us assume that each mode has the same loss, experiences the same attenuation. Now, in this case, it can be proved that the coupling matrix is admission. If you are familiar with admission matrices, that means that it has uh, n real eigenvalues, but most, most importantly, it has n mutually orthogonal eigenvectors. Why that is important? Because these eigenvectors are like eigenstate of the transmission channels. They are orthogonal. And so the fact that they are orthogonal means, again, that you are able to distinguish these eigenvectors. And so again, somehow, there are eight channels available into the, uh, into the fiber link. Now, they are randomly shuffled, but they are there. And so it's just a matter of equalizing the channel. And this can be done by MIMO equalization. So you can borrow all the MIMO knowledge you have from uh, from radio communication, um, I mean, yeah, smartphones and things like that, they do some sort of MIMO uh, equalization, the Wi-Fi or spot, they do MIMO equalization. So you can borrow all that knowledge, bring it into the optical communication domain and apply MIMO equalization to disentangle these, well, actually you do not have to disentangle them because they are orthogonal. You just have to reorient them the right way so to separate the channels and do uh, SDN transmission across the optical fiber. And this is what is actually done. So what is the problem? The problem is that are these N eigenvalues, it can be shown that those eigenvalues are basically the delay of propagation. And so these N eigenstates are characterized by N different delay of propagation. And this means uh, that your MIMO equalizer has to be pretty long because it has to, it has to wait for the uh, full impulse response to the channel. So I think I have a picture here. I, I struggled to find a better graph. I'm sure there is a better graph out there in the scientific literature, but I, I couldn't find anything better than this. I'm sorry. But anyhow, look at, a little bit carefully at this picture. Uh, each of these graphs, you see it's the square modulus of an impulse response. The horizontal axis is time. Notice that these are nanoseconds. And so this graph here is, for example, the impulse response of a 96 kilometer long six mode fiber. And the impulse response that you get when you launch the signal into the port of one mode, this is the fundamental mode, and measure the signal at the same port. 
So you see that the impulse response of this channel is in the order of nanosecond. It's pretty long. If you think about that in this kind of fiber, you're going to do gigabout transmission in the order of tens, several tens of gigabold. So having an impulse response of several nanoseconds, it's pretty long. It means that your MIMO equalizer has to have a lot of taps, a lot of memory. And so that is increasing the complexity of the system. And this is a six by six um, matrix of graph because of course there are six modes in the fiber. So for each input port, you can measure the impulse response at any of the other six, uh, six output ports. But that is what happens, uh, well, sorry. Okay, so we have this coupling that is causing these, um, these uh, random coupling among uh, cross talk among modes. But what my question might ask, but is it coupling really a bad things, a bad thing? Well, actually it depends. Why is that? Because think about two modes propagating in the fiber without coupling. I told you these two modes have different propagation velocities. So if you launch one signal into one mode and the other signal into the other mode, they are going to travel with different speed and they will reach the output of the link at different times, with a slight delay. However, as long as these two channels are independent, this delay is actually immaterial. Then you go to the coupler regime. In the coupler, uh, sorry, before going to the coupler regime, let me stress this point shown in the graph, that in this scenario, I mean, the scenario of uncoupled modes, the delay between the signals increases linearly with distance, of course, because the speed is the same, is constant during propagation. But now let's go to the coupler condition. In the coupler condition, you launch the signal into one mode, and this signal will start randomly jumping from one mode to the other, back and forth, back and forth. And of course, when it couples to the other mode, it changes the speed of propagation because it goes with the speed of propagation of the other mode. And when it goes back to the previous mode, it goes again with the original speed. So you see that this kind of jumping between one mode to the other has the effect of equalizing the speed of propagation, the average speed of propagation, or to be more correct, the average delay of propagation. It is like a random walk. If you took two persons at the same point and they start working in opposite direction at the same speed, then of course the relative distance will increase linearly in time. But if these two persons starts working, walking randomly, okay, in one direction or the other, after some time, from a statistical point of view, the mean distance will increase over time, but it can be shown that that increase will go with the square root of time in that case, with the square root of distance along the fiber in the case of strongly coupled fiber. And this is a good news because we just said that this differential mode delay, which is at the end the length of the impulse response, uh, the longer that quantity, the higher the complexity of your MIMO equalizer. And so keeping the DMD lower, it's a good option. So there are these two scenarios in SDM. So either you, uh, you are able to keep the modes uncoupled. In that case, the delay increased linearly, but who cares? Because the modes are uncoupled, so the signal are independent of each other. You don't have to do equalization. As partial equalization at, uh, at least. On the opposite side, you want to have very strong coupling so that the stronger the coupling, the lower will be the coefficient behind, before, behind sorry, um, in front of the square root dependence. And so the stronger the coupling, the lower the DMD. What you have to surely avoid is being in between with some coupling not so strong, not so weak. In that case, you will have a huge amount of uh, DMD and the need for a very complex, um, very complex, what is called um, MIMO equalizer. So I'm kind of running out of time. So let me go quickly to the conclusion. Um, what I said to you so far is, as I said, assuming that there is no mode dependent loss, and neither mode-dependent gain, 
uh, which means that any amplifier should amplify this e every mode at the same way. But actually, the world is not perfect. Amplifiers in particular at the moment are far away from being perfect. So especially amplifier introduce some mode dependent gain. The MOOCs MOOC devices, they tend to, in to introduce some mode dependent uh, loss and the same does some kinds of fiber. When that happens, the orthogonality of the eigenvectors of the coupling matrices is lost. And so it can be shown that if the differential mode delay increases the complexity of the system, the mode dependent loss or the mode dependent lay, the gain actually limit the system capacity, okay? And, and so there is a big effort in trying to decrease these two numbers because they are really at the heart of the capacity of, of our system. So this is a comparison between multimode and multi-core fibers. So <clears throat> multimode fibers are likely to, should be able to guarantee a higher number of spatial uh, channels compared to multi-core fibers. Um, however, multi-core fiber have higher degrees of freedom in the design because in multi-mode fiber, you can only design the refractive index profile of the core. In multi-core fiber, you can do that and you can also control the position of the core. So that is an added degrees of freedom that allow you to, to achieve better performances in multi-core fiber because as you see, they tend to have lower DMD, lower MDL. MUX and the MUX is going to be easier. However, multi-core fiber technologies newer than multimode fiber, which is pretty mature technology. So it is still not completely clear which of the two fiber will win in the, in, in the future. Uh, very quickly, this is an example of what can be done with spatial division multiplexing. What are, these are called the HERES experiment. This is a demonstration done, uh, I think in 2020. It's a one petabit per second transmission over 23 kilometer over a single mode fiber over a single fiber this was a 15 mode fiber on top of each mode they multiplexed 382 wdm channels and on each of these channels they transmitted a 24.5 gigabot 64 qim signal the total amount was a spectral efficiency in excess of 100 bit per second. So the total transmission capacity of the link was one petabit per second. This is quite uh, impressive. Noted that the WDM channel was spaced by 25 gigahertz. Uh, this is kind of set up, um, I'm not going to the detail, but I just wanted to highlight to you that um, this is a very, let's say a view from, uh, from far away of this tab, because if you focus just on this simple device, this is just the receiver, the receiver is made of a polarization bit splitter, two 90 degree hybrids that are optical devices doing some optical operation. You need a local oscillator, which is a laser, highly coherent laser that has to uh, interfere, that has to cause the beating with the received signal. Eight photodiodes assembled in four balanced photodiodes and four channel, uh, ADC channel. And this is just to receive one of all of those 382 WDM channel out of 15 modes. So in the previous presentation, we talked about, uh, we heard about silicon photonics, the need of interrogation, and here is to give you an idea of how uh, urgent is this kind of integration in optoelectronics and silicon photonics devices. Uh, okay, I think I can skip these. It's, these are, those are details about the uh, transmission across this fiber. If you um, are interested, you can ask me later on. Just a quick overview on other possible application because long goal, I mean, transoceanic link and long connection backbone links are not the only application. Uh, in, the, in the last year, there is a, a, a growth in the demand of optical link inside data centers. Now, this number here is again from Cisco. Uh, you probably do not know, but if you 71% of the traffic, data traffic generated by a data center, 
stays within the data center. I mean, it doesn't exit the data, data centers. And so actually data center needs a very dense optical interconnect between servers. And this is why spatial division multiplexing is being considered not just to increase capacity inside the link, but also look at this picture, this number, also to increase the data density. I mean, bit rate uh, per unit of surface inside the data center, because that will greatly simplify the management of the interconnect in the data centers. And that simplification at the end means uh, economy and higher gain. And that brings us to philosophical discussion that uh, maybe we can left for the question time. Uh, another very uh, important application is radio over fiber, especially um, with respect to 5G and 6G technologies. Uh, in those technologies, the, they, they rely on very small um, cells. So the, um, the antennas, the, the, uh, the radio base station are becoming denser and denser and higher in man number because you want to do pico cell in order to manage a large number of user. And so there is a need to, to treat high frequency, high radio frequency signal, uh, potentially at every antenna, that could be quite expensive. So the approach is that at the antenna, there is actually the least technology needed to collect the signal and route it through an optical fiber link to central office where the RF radio frequency signal is actually elaborated, the information is extracted. So you have a situation like this, for example, where a multi-core fiber, so let me show what this is. So this is the central office where the complex electronics is kept in a safe place at a very far distance. So see here, it's 10 kilometers in this case. You have the remote, the remote radio unit the one that is actually transmitting the radio signal to the user, and this is the user, the end user, so the user equipment. So you see here, the idea is even to send across the optical fiber, the signal being modulated on, uh, on an optical carrier, and then you just need an, an a photodiode and an amplifier to convert the modulation signal into an electrical signal, which is straight transmitted by the antenna. So all the complex electronics is kept into a safer place and not at the antenna, which are typically installed on roofs, exposed to the sun in, in summer, to chill temperature in, uh, in winter and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> Matteo, I guess I'm running out of time, right? Yes, in principle, yes, especially because at two we have the students' workshop. So yes, yeah, so you I'm are recovering what you have. Uh, I, lost yes, 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 I'm, I'm play, just but... moving. To the conclusion, this last slide is just to, to stress once more that now that you have, we are going to have spatial division multiplexing. On each spatial channel, you can have WDM multiplexing. And in future, the idea is that you can combine freely WDM and SDM channels, creating what they are called super channels or these hybrid super channels where you transmit together some channels on using some of the uh, spatial channels and some of the spectral channels to further increase the capacity of, of, of the network. And very last slide, we in Italy have an excellence in this perspective because in L'Aquila, there is the world first and so far unique still deployed SDM testbed. You know, L'Aquila uh, about 10 years ago was struck very, high, by, very hard by an earthquake. And in the aftermath of that earthquake, the city received um, a large amount of fundings to reconstruct the city and also to improve it. And among the idea was these of installing these uh, optical network, fiber optic network to serve the city mainly, but the colleagues from the University of L'Aquila, which by the way, are very expert of the topic, had the idea of using this infrastructure to install opt also uh, the links made with these new uh, multi-mode and multi-core fibers. And so this is a unique facility worldwide, which is attracting researchers from all over the world. It's um, an excellence we have available here in Italy. And that's it. Just to conclude that 
partial division multiplexing is the way to future optical communication that is the final key message, take home message from these long and I hope not too heavy presentation. Thank you. <laughs>